Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Randy sent me notes and Steve, check out this opinion from a court. It's kind of interesting because they quoted Dr. Seuss, Dr. Seuss. And courts don't generally involve a whole lot of levity in their proceedings, but they did that for a reason. And so when I first saw the headline, I thought, oh, that's cute. Court of Appeals citing Dr. Seuss. Uh, They're probably poking a little bit of fun at somebody. And then I read the opinion. And the opinion, which is 10 pages long, and I'm going to read big portions of it to you, is one of the most scathing opinions I've ever read. And I've read a lot of legal opinions. This opinion right here is one of the biggest (laughs) smackdowns that I've ever seen in a legal setting. And it involves Rod Blagojevich versus the state of Illinois. And this is out of the Northern District, Illinois, Eastern Division. And this is a federal court opinion. And you might know that Rod Blagojevich was the governor of the state of Illinois. And uh, he left the Dirksen Federal Building in disgrace. He was charged, tried, and convicted of more than 10 counts of corruption. He received a sentence of 14 years. And the Seventh Circuit largely affirmed that, saying that the evidence... Much of it from Blagojevich's own mouth is overwhelming. And that's a quote from the earlier opinion. So while the charges were pending, the Illinois General Assembly took decisive action to remove him from office. Now, it's said here that Blagojevich inspired bipartisanship because the Illinois House of Representatives impeached him by a vote of 117 to 1. The Illinois Senate convicted him and removed him from office by a vote of 59 to to zero. At that point, his career came to a close. The music stopped, the curtain fell, and he exited stage left. I'm reading from the opinion, (laughs) but it gets better. He's back. Blagojevich didn't have a graceful exit from public life. It was disgraceful. By the look of things, it wasn't even an exit because he wants back in the game and back on center stage, microphone in hand. Blagojevich served almost eight years in prison before receiving a presidential commutation. After regaining his freedom, Blagojevich wants to regain the ability to represent the good people of Illinois. So he came back to Dirksen Federal Building hoping for a warmer reception and a new lease on political life. He unveiled a two-count pro se complaint under Section 1983 and neighboring provisions challenging the treatment that he received in the Illinois legislature. He's upset that they impeached him. The first count seeks an injunction to enjoin the state of Illinois and all of its component parts from enforcing the state Senate's disqualifying provision, which denies him his right to run for office in Illinois. He says that violates the Sixth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment of the Constitution. The second count seeks a declaratory judgment, rendering the state Senate's disqualifying provision as null and void because it violates the First Amendment rights of the voters of Illinois. He adds that the people's right to vote is a fundamental right, And by that, he apparently means the fundamental right to vote for him. (laughs) Here's where it gets good. The complaint is riddled with problems. If the problems are fish in a barrel, the complaint contains an entire school of tuna. And tuna, by the way, are big fish. (laughs) It is a target-rich environment. The complaint is an issue-spotting wonderland. For starters... He cannot sue the state of Illinois under Section 1983. That statute authorizes a claim against a person for violating federal rights. A state is not a person. So despite what its name might suggest, the land of Lincoln is not a person. The same conclusion applies to the Illinois General Assembly. The legislature isn't a person either. Even if Blagojevich could get his foot in the door, he wouldn't get very far before hitting his head on the constitutional architecture. The structure of the Constitution stands in his way, horizontally and vertically. From a horizontal perspective, the separation of powers prevents a court from interfering with the business of the legislative branch when it comes to impeachments. From a vertical perspective, federalism prevents a federal court from interfering with the internal affairs of a state legislature. Taking a step back, the Constitution entrusts different branches with different spheres of authority. Each branch must stay in its lane and avoid overstepping the line and invading the space of the other branches. 
Good fences make good neighbors, and the Constitution is no exception. Impeachment is a prime example of how the Constitution divides territory and sets boundaries. We're talking about the impeachment of a governor. The Constitution vests the authority to remove public officials through impeachment in the hands of the legislative branch, not the judicial branch. The sole power of impeachment rests with the House of Representatives, and the sole power to try an impeachment rests with the Senate. Those are quotes from the Constitution. The sole power, S-O-L-E, sole. And what's funny is a lot of people who aren't lawyers don't understand how condescending this is being written. But they're not insulting the readers or insulting Blagojevich. The Constitution vests the power over impeachment in the legislative branch. It does not take much interpretive detective work to figure out that the judiciary has no seat at the table. Congress has the power. The judiciary has none. To cement the point, the text uses the word soul twice. Constitution isn't chock full of adjectives, but the framers made a point of saying that the sole power to impeach rests with the House and the sole power to remove rests with the Senate. Soul is a polite way of saying that the other branches need to butt out. The Constitution expressly entrusts impeachment to the legislature, so it implicitly divests the judiciary of any power to intervene. So the judiciary must keep its nose out of another branch's business and vice versa. To check the impeachment power, the framers quite naturally relied on the political accountability of members of Congress. Thus, judges, who on so many issues have the last word, must rely on the public as the ultimate check on impeachment itself, the Constitution's explicit check on their own excesses. In fact, the framers expressly rejected proposals to give the judiciary a role in impeachment proceedings. And so the judge goes through basically a history lesson explaining how insane it is to suggest that this court could overturn the impeachment <laughs> that took place a few years ago that was overwhelming to impeach him. Blagojevich is, and I'm skipping a big chunks of this because there's a lot of um, citations to support the argument. Blagojevich has given this court no reason to think that Illinois would be one of the states to allow judicial review of an impeachment. There isn't a lot of case law in Illinois on this, and in fact, there isn't any case law, and for good reason. In its 205-year history, the Illinois General Assembly has impeached, convicted, and removed one public official, Blagojevich. <laughs> Even if Illinois courts gave the green light to judicial review as a matter of state law, it would not mean that a federal court could get involved. Justiciability in a federal court is a federal question, and justiciability includes the political question doctrine. The Supreme Court in the Nixon case raised concerns about embroiling courts in political questions, and those concerns also exist when an impeachment involves a state official. The bottom line is that the judiciary has no power to unimpeach, unconvict, and unremove a public official. The legislature taketh away, the judiciary cannot giveth back. <laughs> the separation of powers is a horizontal barrier. It keeps the judiciary from meddling in the affairs of the legislature. But here, Blagojevich's suit hits the vertical barrier too, which is federalism. The Constitution separates power between the federal and state governments, and for good reason. The separation of the two spheres is one of the Constitution's structural protections of liberty. Just as the separation and independence of the coordinate branches of the federal government served to prevent the accumulation of excessive power in any one branch, a healthy balance of power between the states and the federal government will reduce the risk of tyranny and abuse from either front. The allocation of powers in our federal system preserves the integrity, dignity, and residual sovereignty of the states. The federal balance is, in part, an end in itself to ensure that states function as political entities in their own right. So they're citing other cases there. The Supreme Court has cautioned federal courts against meddling with the internal affairs of state governments. The need to avoid interference with state proceedings is a theme running through many different areas of law. And they give all kinds of examples. At bottom, Blagojevich is asking this court to undo a state proceeding and unwind a decision by duly elected representatives of the people of Illinois. The idea of a federal court intermeddling in the affairs of a state legislature is startlingly unattractive. And that's citing another case. Blagojevich isn't asking his court to second-guess a federal impeachment. He is inviting his court to get involved in a state impeachment. If intervention by a federal court in a federal impeachment is bad, 
that intervention by a federal court in a state impeachment is worse. Another jurisdictional issue lurks in the background, however. In essence, Blagojevich is asking his court to exercise appellate jurisdiction over state proceeding. By analogy, under the Rooker-Feldman doctrine, state court losers cannot run to federal court to undo what happened in state court. If state court losers can't run to the federal courthouse and challenge something that happened in state court, it's hard to see why state impeachment losers can run to the federal courthouse and challenge something that happened in the state legislature. Yes, they're calling Blagojevich a state impeachment loser. And also, there are standing issues. Blagojevich seeks to protect the right of voters to cast ballots for him. (laughs) But a plaintiff generally lacks standing to assert the rights of others. The plaintiff generally must assert his own legal rights and interests and cannot rest his claim to relief on the legal rights or interests of third parties. Courts have held that litigants lack standing to assert the voting rights of others. So they're saying, technically speaking, if somebody had stood up and said, I'd like to vote for him, but he's not, a, he's not available in the ballot, they could at least make that argument. They'd have standing for the argument. If they lose, it's a bad argument, but they'd have standing to make the argument. There's somebody pointing out that every single thing that's possibly wrong with this guy's complaint is wrong. So redressability might be problematic as well. The impeachment and removal by the Illinois General Assembly is not the only barrier keeping Blagojevich off the ballot. Under Illinois law, a convicted felon cannot hold public office. Oh, that. That, Is that in my permanent record? (laughs) The Illinois Election Code provides that any person convicted of an infamous crime shall thereafter be prohibited from holding any office of honor, trust, or profit unless such person is again restored to such rights by the terms of pardon for the offense and has received a restoration of rights by the governor or otherwise according to law. Illinois courts have interpreted infamous crimes to include conspiracy and fraud, and Blagojevich was convicted of conspiracy and fraud. So even if this court held that the Illinois General Assembly got it all wrong during the impeachment process, it would make no difference. An independent state law barrier stands in the way of holding public office ever again for him. The case might not be ripe either, by the way, which is another problem. Blagojevich didn't exactly file his complaint at the federal courthouse in the dead of night. He took the unusual step of calling a press conference to let the world know that he's filing a complaint. Along the way, he expressed doubt about whether he planned to run for office ever again. This is a quote. I may or may not run for public office again. I don't have any particular plans to do it. I don't have any plans to do it. The very thought of doing all that again makes me groan. And they cite here WGN's news. So Blagojevich wants the ability to run for office, but isn't sure if he wants to run for office. He might run. If given the chance, he might not. His plans haven't fully ripened, so maybe his claim hasn't ripened either. (laughs) A claim is not ripe for adjudication if it rests upon contingent future events that may not occur as anticipated or indeed may never occur at all. So in other words, if he pleaded and said, I want to run, I tried registering, they wouldn't let me, I intend to run on this date for this, then they're saying, well, then you'd have a ripe claim. Now, all the other problems are still there, but they're simply pointing out there's like 10 things here and he, and he loses on every single one of them. All of these problems stand in the way of his claim before even getting to the merits. And on the merits, there's trouble on the horizon. For starters, he alleges a violation of the Sixth Amendment during his impeachment proceeding. But the Sixth Amendment applies to criminal cases. And of course, an impeachment proceeding is not a criminal prosecution. After all, Blavogoyevich didn't go to prison because of what happened in the legislature. He went to prison because of what happened in the federal courthouse. Impeachment didn't lead to prison time. The Illinois General Assembly took away his job, not his liberty. The court wants to make clear here that impeachment and criminal proceedings are very, very separate and goes through the history of it and points out that the Constitution expressly forbids criminal consequences from impeachment. And that reality reaffirms that impeachment is not a criminal proceeding. Impeachment is a firing and a removal from public life. In the popular imagination, impeachment is often treated as if conviction still leads to drawing and quartering, but it just means loss of a job. Personally, devastating to be sure, 
but not death, imprisonment, forfeiture, financial ruin, or anything like it. You simply return to private life. And that's a quote from my book called High Crimes and Misdemeanors, A History of Impeachment. The complaint also invokes the right to due process under the 14th Amendment, but scholars have questioned whether there is a right to due process at all in an impeachment proceeding, let alone a judicially enforceable right to due process. Uh, Again, the legislature has the power to create its own rules and afford as many procedural protections as it sees fit. All of these problems, and perhaps more, stand in the way of his claim. The simple reality is that the federal courts have no role to play when it comes to a state impeachment. The state legislature decided to remove Blagojevich from public life, and it is not the place of a federal court to bring him back. The case began with great fanfare, surrounded by microphones and cameras with a gaggle of press in tow. Blagojevich announced to the world that he might want a sequel in public life. And here's the paragraph we've all been waiting for. The book is closed, the last page already turned, and the final chapter of his public life is over. The case never should have been filed. Read generally, Dr. Seuss. Will you please go now? The time has come. The time has come. The time is now. Just go. 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 I don't care how. You can go by foot. You can go by cow. (laughs) Marvin K. Mooney, will you please go now? So the court is saying, Rod Blagojevich, just go. Go. Case started with a megaphone, but it ends with a whimper. Sometimes cases in the federal courthouse attract publicity, but the courthouse is no place for a publicity stunt. He wants back, but he's already gone. Case dismissed. And the opinion is signed by Stephen Seeger, U.S. District Judge. But notice that I think that sentence actually sums it up. The courthouse is no place for a publicity stunt. So the man filed a lawsuit where he says that he's suing the state of Illinois and the General Assembly because he wants the right to run for public office again. And the federal court points out that we can't fix that problem for you. That is not a problem we can fix. They go through all the reasons, and at the very end, they go, it looks like a publicity stunt, because even you said you're not sure if you want to run again. But you want the right to run, even though you might not run again? So there's all kinds of problems there. And I know some people might think this is political of me to talk about this. But number one, I'm not in Illinois. So I didn't really follow the Bogoyevich case that closely. But I do find this fascinating because I think that a lot of people don't spend a lot of time thinking about how some of the more obscure things in the Constitution work. And, of course, impeachment is something we've heard about in our lifetimes. Uh, And the question always is, what's that process like? How does it work? And they'll often say... That And they'll frame it this way. They'll say, well, the impeachment happens this way. The House will issue uh, the impeachment, in essence, indictment. And then there's a trial in the Senate. So it sounds like a criminal procedure, but it's not a criminal procedure. It is its own procedure. And so I think that's important to understand also. So I think Rod Blagojevich ain't going to be running for office anytime soon in Illinois. (laughs) And if you want to have some fun reading as far as court opinions go, this one's a pretty good one. Like I said, it's 10 pages. It's really only nine because the last page is a signature block. Nine pages long. Honorable Stephen C. Seeger wrote that. It's from United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois Eastern Division. Rod R. Blagojevich, plaintiff versus State of Illinois and the Illinois General Assembly. And Randy sent it. Thanks a lot. It's not often you hear of Dr. Seuss being cited in an opinion, although, don't forget, I was cited in an opinion in a footnote just a couple of months ago. So crazier things have happened. <laughs> Questions or comments, put them below those. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. What I'm looking for is a blessing that's not in disguise.